This is the White Coat Investor Podcast, Milestones to Millionaire, celebrating stories of success along the journey to financial freedom. This is Milestones to Millionaire Podcast number 128, Podiatrist Pays Off His Student Loans. Getting quality disability and life insurance should be the first financial chore for a doctor to complete. Most docs don't have the ideal policy for their gender, specialty, state, or health status. And one in seven doctors get disabled at some point during their career. Because these policies can only be purchased through brokers, we have put together a list of vetted agents who are experienced with working with the specific needs of medical professionals and who have your best interest at heart. If you have questions about insurance and what kind of policies would be the best fit for you, check out our insurance recommended list whitecoatinvestor.com slash insurance and feel that peace of mind that comes with knowing you have the optimal policy in place. You can do this and the White Coat Investor can help. Again, whitecoatinvestor.com slash insurance. All right, we have got a great episode today. We have a doc who has paid off his debt, um, but stay tuned afterward. We're going to talk about the Dave Ramsey baby steps and uh, maybe how to think about those and um, how to think about Dave Ramsey and, and what's going on over there. So stay tuned after the interview. Our guest today on the Milestones to Millionaire podcast is Jeffrey. Welcome to the podcast. Happy to be here, Dr. Dolly. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's wonderful to have you here. And, and uh, we're excited because you have accomplished a not insignificant financial goal. Tell us what you've done. Yeah, so uh, main one has paid off $209,000 in 69 months. Wow, that's yeah. just awesome. So congratulations. And you said in how many months? Yeah, 69. 69 months. Yeah. So just short of three years out of training. Okay. That doesn't that doesn't add up in my head. Oh, uh, so five and a half months of paying it off, but okay. we we uh, finally completed two and a half years out of training. Two and a half years out of training. Yeah. Ah, I got it. Yeah, so yeah, you're yeah. paying some on it during training. Yeah, I was. <laughs> ah, I got it now. Now it all makes sense. Sorry well, about that. I should have clarified. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, the way I guess I think about it is, yeah, you paid something during training, but it's hard to pay a lot during training. Did yeah. you pay off a lot of your debt during training? Uh, yeah, I did. I, I think a significant chunk. I mean, in the first six months, when I started with my salary, my wife was still working. She was making around 70K. And okay. we decided that that first six months of salary would go towards the debt. So I paid off my federal undergrad loans, which was like $26,000 in that six months, okay. and then just kept going from there. Very cool. How did that feel coming into podiatry school with a bunch of undergraduate debt, knowing you were going to borrow more? Do you remember that moment when you're like, oh, man? Oh, absolutely. And I didn't I don't think I appreciated it at the time, but we were fortunate with the setup between my wife and I as far as trying to be as conservative as possible with borrowing, you know, this debt, because we luckily had her salary that helped us out. Um, but we certainly didn't want to take more than we needed. But still, when you left, when you walked out of podiatry school, how much did you owe? Yeah, so it, you know, with undergrad, it was two hundred nine thousand dollars. Two hundred nine thousand dollars. Okay. Wow. It's uh, it's obviously there's people that have more and there's people that have less, mm-hmm. but uh, it's a lot of money when you owe it, isn't it? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. It kind of <laughs> hangs on that over your head and. There was definitely a behavioral component to trying to get this paid down as quickly as possible. Yeah. You know, a lot of people have trouble figuring out how much to pay toward their debt and how much to invest. How did you solve that riddle? Well, so I, unfortunately, I didn't find you till about mid-2020. So there were three years we were advocates of following a Dave Ramsey plan. And uh, so it was a behavioral side of things of just paying it down as quickly as possible. So we kind of put savings aside and okay. threw a lot of it at debt. Um, certainly, uh-huh. my wife was saving towards her 401k, so we have a little bit of that left over when she dis- when she fully stayed at home. But um, it, it it was all going towards debt. Very cool, very cool. And how's it feel now that it's gone? I guess I could share the story now. It, it was it was very monumental. I feel like at least in my financial life, when it did happen, because it was a large chunk at the very end. It was actually during tax season this past year that it happened. So there was an unknown, and obviously I'm correcting this as I go on, but unknowingly large check during tax return that just paid a lot of this off, um, which was exciting. You made you made a tax uh, an interest free loan to the government for a while. Yeah. You say, yeah. you know, I don't want to do that again. 
<laughs> okay, so did this was this whole thing easier or harder than you thought it was going to be? Yeah, so it was easy when I wrote those two checks. Actually, we paid off my st- <laughs> we paid off my student loans, and we also paid off our car at the same time. Okay. And and that was a pretty significant chunk too. We we had a forerunner that was our family grew up. You know, you know, we had two girls and he had a bigger SUV, so we paid that off. But um, it was hard looking back at it because of just some of the sacrifices. I mean, we certainly didn't live on rice and beans, but we certainly enjoyed ourselves throughout the process. But um, then becoming awakened in 2020 with your, you know, with the help of you, um, I feel like I could have done things a little bit differently, you know, as far as savings and things like that, and kind of had a better plan. But now we have a good written plan in place. And, and uh, that makes it a little bit easier then to deal with the debt. Yeah, the nice thing about this riddle, however you solve it, you know, you put some toward investments, and you put some toward debt or whatever, is that when you're done with the debt, you can then go all toward investments. So it's not like, yeah, (laughs) it's not like you really lose either way. It's just different folks for different folks. Exactly. so tell us about your income over the 69 months. I mean, part of it, yeah. you were in training mm-hmm. still, I assume. You did some sort of a residency fellowship. Yeah. Um, weren't getting paid that much. But tell us about your range of income over that 69 months for yeah. your household. Yeah, sure. So uh, I was in residency for three years, so 2017 to 2020. And uh, it ranged from 55 to 60,000. My wife was in the technology business, and she ranged from 70 to 100. Um, so combined, you know, looking at that range. And through that time, you know, we were, again, just trying to save as or put that, that uh, money towards debt as much as possible. Um, but it, it was a significant chunk. I, you know, I, I was happy that my wife was able to find a good career for herself and, and work during that time period. So you were paying off debt. Were these federal loans or had you refinanced them? So my undergrad was federal loans. My medical school was actually private loans. Um, oh. It was like a family loan, and um, it. There so you were you were on the federal zero percent plan, like a lot of people have been the last. No, three years. and and even though the interest rate was extremely reasonable, it was still a behavioral component of getting that paid off, and I didn't want that hanging over our head. Okay. Very cool. Yeah. So. Um, any family money? Did you get an inheritance? Did your parents help you pay for school? Or was this kind of all on you, first generation wealthy person? Yeah, so the undergrad loan was was help from parents a little bit. Uh, they took out uh, some federal loans as well. Uh, and then I had academic loans going into undergrad. Yeah. They, they borrowed money and they paid off the money? Or they, they borrowed they the did. money and you paid off the money? <laughs> no, it was 50-50. So they borrowed okay. a little bit, paid it off. That was their their, you know, gift to us. But, um, you know, certainly looking at that scenario and, and what I want to do for my kids, you know, trying to be more proactive and hopefully not being in that scenario where we may not have to borrow. Hopefully, you know, we have a UTMA or, you know, we already have our, our 529 set up and, and then being able to cash flow, hopefully some of it too. You say you're the last generation that's going to borrow for school. <laughs> I don't know about that because we don't know what the future <laughs> holds for us. But right. um, yeah, with with uh, it's crazy talking to these uh, high school students going into undergrad and what they're paying for school too. I, I just you know it's nice we get I'm in private practice so we do get some high school students that come in and learn a little bit about podiatry and uh, I give them the the financial talk too you know give them that right mindset and hopefully inspire them to think about that as they move forward into undergrad and eventually into medical school. Hopefully you don't talk them all out of medicine and into, uh, you know, going into business and finance. Uh, but. <laughs> it's, it's up for debate. <laughs> yeah, that, that's what happened to at least one of my nephews and one of my kids. You know, they, they, they saw it. They're like, wait a minute, Dad, you have two jobs and one of them seems better than the other <laughs> yeah. one. I, I do have to say now that we got this taken care of, I mean, a lot of things happened in the past three years. I had two kids. Uh, I got board certified and we paid off the debt. And I just feel like I'm on, you know, the top of the world right now, being able to feel free to kind of make my schedule and, and being in private practice. And that's one of the things that I would advise is considering private practice or at least a group setting, you know, versus a hospital setting. But um, it's it's been freeing for sure. So tell me, you know, nuts and bolts, uh, you know, how'd you do this? How, I mean, it sounds like you're working pretty closely with your spouse, but 
But uh, tell us how you actually did it. I mean, you managed to carve out a pretty good chunk of your income and just throw it toward debt in the last five years. So tell, tell us how you managed to do that, because it's hard for a lot of people. Yeah, absolutely. The very first thing was getting on the same page with my wife. Now, at the time, we were still dating and then eventually um, married. But, you know, we had the same mindset. We came up from a similar upbringing. So we verbally had this idea of wanting to pay down the debt as much as possible. But there was nothing concrete, of course, following some of the steps of Dave Ramsey. But, you know, it didn't come to a good, solid written plan until 2020. But, you know, the majority of the debt being paid off or I should say half of it, you know, was those first those first three years. But I mean, just behaviorally, just hating that hanging over our head. So month to month, we would budget and we did do a written budget. And that certainly was extremely helpful. And seeing those large chunks just being thrown at the debt and seeing that go down. We, since, you know, 2017, 2018, we had a paper written list of the 209 debt. And it hung on the refrigerator amongst our various rentals. And we would just cross off every time we would pay off those big chunks and just see that number drop and drop. And another fun thing that we did, um, my wife and I, we were in, we love wine. So every $25,000, we would have a nice bottle <laughs> of wine picked out to enjoy together, you know? So it was definitely. And, a and now looking for- back, you're thinking you should have done it every 5,000. Yeah, huh? exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we don't celebrate milestones as much as we should. Yeah. And, and then all of a sudden, all the milestones are gone. And yeah. you're like, now we have nothing to celebrate. Exactly. So, yeah. so it was the little wins. You definitely have to appreciate those little wins to get through it. Yeah, for sure. Okay, advice for someone that wants to do what you did. Let's say they're sitting here coming up at the end of, of medical school or dental school or podiatry school or pharmacy school or whatever. They know they got a big chunk of debt. They hate it. They don't want to have it. They want to wipe it out relatively quickly. Yeah. What advice do you have for them? Yeah, absolutely. I I definitely took time to think about this because I wish I could tell myself some of these things back when I first started to just a little bit be more well-rounded, but um, definitely the team approach, like being on the same pace with your same page with your spouse and um, going through a specific written plan. And I am definitely the one who's the Excel spreadsheet guy and my wife is not, but she's also the one who introduced me to Dave Ramsey. So luckily we had, you know, coming from a similar area, but um, working that out, having conversations, you know, having an open line of communication throughout the entire time, um, minimizing unnecessary debt. So, you know, I'm sure you had classmates too who maybe took out more than what they really needed and they're enjoying it, nice restaurants and, you know, trips and things like that. But I feel like we, you know, stay pretty modest throughout schooling. Um, and then frugality, you know, and that's going the same lines. That's going throughout all of, you know, paying off the debt enjoying yourself, enjoying the little wins, um, and don't put your life on hold. You know, there was a time when, after my wife and I got married, as far as like when we were ready to have kids and things like that, and you know, that that huge amount just looming over your head, and that can sometimes cloud your judgment of the big picture of you living your life. And of course, it's easier now that that's gone, but, um, putting that in perspective, you know, you really got to think about that. So whoever you're with, or if you're by yourself, you know, have a game plan for yourself to be able to get through this. Um, And one thing, at least in my field is ownership. Um, That has become a big thing for me. Uh, Shortly after, you know, these events, you know, during these three years, I also became partner at my practice too. And that opened up my eyes to ownership. And I know you're a big proponent for ownership too. So those are on the horizon, you know, moving forward for other things. And I'm so glad that I did that because I loved your recent um, blog about uh, it's a not a vacation, it's a lifestyle. And that it was just eye-opening. And even though not necessarily traveling as much, but I have no problem looking a month in the future, taking, blocking that day off and just let's, let's go down to the Baltimore Aquarium or let's go here, there, or there and, and not think twice about it. You know, it's, I don't feel like certainly we got to keep the lights on in this practice, but, uh, we still need to worry about ourselves and take care of ourselves. And that's the final thing that I would say is through this journey of financial wellness, I found personal development and, you know, putting time and effort into reading books and listening to podcasts. 
I then looked into more personal development things and, and just trying to have a good um, flow through the day, through the months and, and really working on relationships, um, making our family stronger and, and moving forward that way. Awesome. Well, congratulations. I mean, this is really significant. You should be proud of yourself and what you've done. You have started your career on the right financial foot. You're going to be incredibly successful financially in your lives. Uh, you have basically changed, you know, in the words of Dave Ramsey, you've changed <laughs> your family tree. Right. I you know, your that. kids certainly uh, almost surely aren't going to be borrowing for their education. And this sort of stuff gets carried forward generation to generation. And you've done this. So you should be really proud of that. And, and I hope it inspires others to do the same. But thank you so much for coming on the Milestone Podcast. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Ali. I appreciate it. All right. I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, it's always beautiful to see someone pay off student loans. You know, I always feel like you're not really done with school until you've paid off the loans. And it feels like you just have a whole lot more, not just financial freedom, but career freedom. Once that has taken place, you got options to take different jobs, lower paying jobs, take a risk on a, on a business or an entrepreneurial venture that maybe you couldn't before when you had these big fat student loan payments. So I always like seeing those gone. All right. I promised you we were going to talk about the Dave Ramsey baby steps. Now, for those who have no idea who Dave Ramsey is, it's probably not very many of you, but there's probably some of you out there. Dave Ramsey is a TV uh, radio host, I guess more radio than TV um, who's been kind of dispensing financial advice over the airwaves for the last 25 years or so. He's kind of at the tail end of his career, uh, trying to figure out how to pass his empire on to his daughter, it sounds like. But he, over the years, he's come up with a, a relatively simple plan. Some might describe it as simplistic or overly simple, but a simple plan to help people to make some progress in their finances. And the nice thing about a simple, straightforward plan is it's easy to remember, easy to implement, and relatively easy to do. Uh, the problem is when it comes down to uh, something like this is kind of what Einstein said, that you want to make things as simple as possible, but not simpler. The problem with the baby steps, sometimes it makes things maybe simpler. There's always this uh, issue of trying to decide between the proper behavioral solution and the proper uh, you know, mathematical or intellectual solution. Because the truth is most people that get into debt trouble have got a car loan and four credit card loans and a personal loan and a mortgage and a HELOC. You know, and, and the reason they have debt is not because they can't do math. The reason they have debt is because they have bad financial behavior. And so I think Dave recognizes this, that there's a whole lot of people out there with just bad financial behavior. And the nice thing about these baby steps is they're pretty good at correcting bad financial behavior. If you follow them, you will get wealthy eventually. It might not be the very best way. It might not be the most mathematically correct way. You might leave a little money on the table following the baby steps, but they're going to work. It's not like doing this doesn't work for doctors. It absolutely does. So let's talk about his baby steps. His step one is to save $1,000 for what he calls a starter emergency fund. You know, this is something you could use to replace a dryer that goes out or, you know, you blow a tire and you need to replace the four tires on your car. That keeps you from having to borrow more money. You can now use your emergency fund to pay for that and then rebuild your emergency fund. Once you have $1,000 sitting in your checking account, he moves you on to step two where he wants you to pay off all of your non-mortgage debt, everything, student loans, uh, personal loans, car loans, credit cards, whatever. Anything that's not a mortgage, he wants you to pay it off in step two before doing anything else. That's right, before investing, before putting money in your 401k, before getting your 401k match, before doing anything else. <clears throat> and the nice thing about doing it this way is you have this intense focus on the goal right? Every spare dollar you can get. I mean, this is kind of his beans and rice stage. He doesn't want you eating out or, you know, he doesn't want you seeing the inside of a restaurant unless you work there. Um, and everything's going toward your debt. And, uh, and that's great. You know, does it work? Yes. Is it more harsh than maybe you need to be if you're making $375,000 a year? Probably, but it works. Once you've paid off all that debt, you move on to step three. And this is where you get a real emergency fund, which is the classic three to six months worth of your expenses sitting in, you know, checking or savings or a money market fund, et cetera. Okay. 
once you've got that emergency fund in place, you've paid off all your debt, you've got your emergency fund in place, now you can invest. And he recommends you save 15% for retirement. 15% works for the average American for a couple of reasons. One, their career is relatively long. You know, if you start working at 18 and you work till you're 65, that's a lot of years, right? That's 47 years. That's a long time. And so 15% works for that. The other reason 15% works for the average American is because Social Security will make up a bigger portion of the retirement spending than it will for most high-income professionals. My recommendation on retirement savings is 20% because you're starting later. You know, most of you aren't starting saving for retirement until 30 to 35. That first 12 years, gone. You know, you spent that in undergrad, medical school, residency, fellowship, et cetera. It's gone, okay? And Social Security, while it's going to be there for you in some form or another, isn't going to make up as large of a percentage of your retirement income as it will for the typical American. And so 20% is the number. And if you do that, if you carve out 20% of your income from the time you get out of your training and you work a typical career, you know, you work 25, 30 years, you will have enough money to maintain your lifestyle in retirement. Same lifestyle you had before you retired, you'll be able to maintain in retirement. So 20% is the number there. Dave Ramsey's step five is to start saving for your children's college. And I like that this comes after step four because it's true. You should prioritize retirement before college. You know, you got more options for college. I mean, if you don't have any college savings for them, what can they do? Well, they can work in the summers. They can work during the school year. They can get scholarships. They can go to a less expensive school. They can even borrow. You're not going to get student loans for retirement, right? But they can still get student loans uh, for college, you know, to pay for an inexpensive private or state university. You can still borrow for that. Um, So I like that where that step comes in after you've got kind of retirement on track, not your retirement fully funded, but your retirement on track. Step six for Dave is paying off your home early. This is where the mortgage debt comes in and he likes to see you free and clear. I kind of feel similarly. Our mortgage was paid off after seven years after we got in the house. Um, We had it on a 15 year. Um, I just don't like carrying mortgage debt into retirement. Yes, I know how leverage works. I know that if you're borrowing at 2 or 3% and earning at 10%, you're coming out ahead. Um, but you know what? You just have a lot more ability to take risk in your career, in your finances, when you don't have that mortgage debt sitting over your head. So I don't have a problem with that one uh, coming in at this point because step seven is uh, you know where it gets all vague. You know, he calls it build wealth and give. Well, okay, that's just everything else in your financial life. Um, You know, maybe you're mixing some of that in with the other steps. Life can be a little bit more complicated. You don't have to follow this exact formula to become wealthy. Will it work? Yeah, it'll work. And if you're having trouble with debt, if you keep finding yourself getting into debt over and over again, maybe you need this rigid of a plan. Uh, But most uh, doctors, most dentists, most you know, podiatrists, whatever you are, attorney, small business owner, tech worker, whatever, high income professional of some kind, you're going to be able to uh, take care of this stuff. You can just afford to make more mistakes, if you will. I put mistakes in quote, in quotes, uh, and still be successful. So um, if you've never heard of that, I think the baby steps are useful to know. Um, but you don't have to, you know, treat Dave like he's, you know, some sort of guru or somebody that can do no wrong, right? Lots of people criticize Dave and his business practices for various reasons. I don't like the fact that he refers you to financial advisors that are really commissioned salesmen, for instance. Other people don't like the way he runs his business with a bit of an evangelical, uh, focus, um, uh, I think he got into some trouble recently with uh, one of his partners that was a was helping people to get out of timeshares. And it turned out this timeshare exit team was kind of a scam too, which was unfortunate because, you know, uh, lots of people don't want to be in their timeshares and they can't get out of their timeshares and anybody that'll help them seems like doing a good deed, but maybe not always. Uh, so there's plenty of things you can criticize Dave about, but uh, I think it's worth learning the baby steps. Take what you find useful leave the rest like anything else in personal finance, including everything I say. All right. Don't forget about quality, disability, and life insurance. If you're not financially independent yet, you need disability insurance. If anybody else depends, 
on your income besides you, you need term life insurance. These should be the first financial chores for a doctor to complete. That's why they're the first two chapters of the White Coat Investors Financial Boot Camp. Lots of docs don't have the ideal policy for their gender, specialty, state, or health status. And the reason disability insurance is so expensive is because doctors actually use it. Statistics show about one out of seven will be disabled at some point during their career. Um, These policies can only be purchased through brokers or agents. So we put together a list of vetted independent agents who are experienced with working with doctors and other medical and high-income professionals. They've got your best interest at heart. They sell hundreds of these policies a year. They know them inside and out. They can help you find the right one and answer all your questions. So if you have questions about insurance, want to have, go over your current policy, see what else is out there, see what may be best for you, check out our insurance recommended list. That's at whitecoatinvestor.com slash insurance. And you'll get that peace of mind that comes with knowing that you've got this chore not only done, but that you have the optimal policy in place. That's whitecoatinvestor.com slash insurance. All right. If you want to come on this podcast, the Milestones podcast, you apply at whitecoatinvestor.com slash milestones, and we'll celebrate what you've done and use that to inspire somebody else to do the same. Till next time, keep your head up, shoulders back. You've got this. and We can help. The hosts of the White Coat Investor are not licensed accountants, attorneys, or financial advisors. This podcast is for your entertainment and information only. It should not be considered professional or personalized financial advice you should consult the appropriate professional for specific advice relating to your situation. 